Good evening. Welcome to the museum at FIT's Fashion Culture Series. Tonight, we are honored to welcome Malika Verma, Kasha Yap, and Sanjay Gard, who will present the Sari series, an anthology of drape. They will show two short independent films and two how-to films on how to drape a sari, and will discuss the diversity, versatility, and perceptions of India's saris. Please join me in welcoming Malika and Sanjay. Thank you, Tanya, and thank you, FIT, for having Sanjay and I here today. Uh, we're in New York uh, for one week and uh, very excited to be here uh, with an audience such as uh, you sharing a little bit um, of the conversations that we continue to have on a daily basis with regards to the sari. Sanjay and I both work with the garment in different ways. Just by way of introduction, Sanjay Garg is a textile designer and the founder of Raw Mango and Sanjay Garg. Um, these are, uh, you know, it's a very much loved sari brand in India, as well as a garment, a garment brand that will be celebrating its 10th anniversary next year and is based out of New Delhi. And so the sari is very much a stronghold of, of Sanjay's work uh, from the the textile stage all the way um, through in terms of you know, the retail stores that the brand has. And uh, as for myself, I'm the founder of Border and Fall. We're a strategic agency working in the, at the intersection of craft and fashion in India. We work with a lot of designers and brands with regards to business development, branding, communication, and we also have a digital publication where the narrative of textile, fashion, and craft comes together uh, on borderandfall.com. And so the Sari series is something that we've been working on for almost two years now. It's a nonprofit project. Uh, Sanjay's been on the advisory board and very closely involved as well. And um, the idea for the project was to essentially document the various sari drapes of India through short film, creating an, a digital anthology of drape and making that accessible to the public uh, on a digital platform. And so we are, um, oh, mom's here. There's front row for you. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, so the idea for us uh, was to uh, create this anthology of drape. It's something that we spent the last two years working towards, and we released them on October 10th. Uh, so just a few weeks away, and we're really excited to be uh, here prior to the launch in New York and sharing a sneak peek of some of the videos, as well as a larger conversation and narrative with regards to the sari. Um, so Sanjay, what were we saying? We should start with maybe the most basic question. Yes. So well, good evening, everyone. Uh, well, I'm sure a lot of people are already aware what is sari, but I just want to uh, little bit describe about it. Uh, there are a few things I'm sure is already known by many of us, but a few things also I'm going to show you through a sari. See, sari technically is an unstitched garment. It's a piece of textile, which is uh, comes in a many different very. Uh, it's worn first of all. Uh, not only in India, people think the sari is an Indian garment, but not so true. Sari is actually worn in Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Maldives, all those different regions. And also, it comes in varied sizes, first of all. The sari, what is known till now, typically uh, one kind of a draped sari, which you put it like that, is like a ulta pallu sari, which is like left, uh, left hand sided. The, the pallu, which is like a, the beginning of the sari, is on the one of the shoulder. So that is what we typically know of today. So A, the sari comes in different width. The width varies from 30 inch to 50 inch. And also the length also varies from three and a half meter to nine meters. And very interesting is that the sari is very well designed like garment, like they have a, they have a the pattern for sleeves or pattern for for trouser to get in, the sari is also very well designed in terms of the border. So what thing is, this borders actually is kind of a fat salvage for the sari, which takes care of the wear and tear of it, and also helps the sari to drape better on the body. It's just not mere a design. So first of all, it's designed in terms of the weight, and then after that, many ornamentation pattern or a metallic jerry came onto it, and that become a shiny, that border, what you say, a sari border. But actually, it is a very functional garment. Even the pallu also, if you see, there's always a pattern this side. It varies from 16 inch to 34 inch to 40 inch. 
which is also very, very well designed. Why? Because it's much heavier than the base fabric. The reason is when you put it like this, it, it has enough weight, so it doesn't just, just come out like that. So I think the thing to remember or to, to take from this is that the sari is, as much as it's a long piece of uncut cloth, it's definitely engineered, uh, especially what we're relating to hand-woven saris, that um, you know it, it has a variable density in, it, in its parts for a particular region where, um, as you know, if you have a hem for something, the purpose of a hem is to allow it to fall better. Or like you were saying, the base of this functions as a selvage. Uh, selvage helps on the wear and tear, right? right. Um, and just as an uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. It yeah. sari also had two pallus actually. Few of the saris. Pa pallu is the end piece. So, so you could wear it from other side. One, once it's torn from this side, you can change it from other side. And the torn one got get inside, and you wear it from other side. So, so one of the reason has that kind of saris as well. So, so just as an example, this is um, a, a five and a half yard. Uh, it's the one that I'm wearing right now as well, just in terms of me, just in, in terms of length. And they range from three and a half to about nine yards. That's so, right. So that, that's kind of like the technical what is a sari that we wanted to kind of baseline run you, you know, sort of through. But I think the question is much more loaded, right? Mm -hmm. um, the sari is so many things. Um, it's also a very emotional uh, garment. It's something that uh, there's a lot of sentimentality attached to it. I I think in all the research that we've done and all the conversations that we've had in terms of asking people what a sari reminds them of, what does it mean to them, you hear a lot of people saying, um, it reminds me of my grandmother, right? Or it reminds me of when I was younger and, and summers or, um, you know, it reminds me of, yeah, hot, hot days in Delhi because my nani would wear crisp you know, crisp cotton saris. So I think, um, you know, people speak about their weddings and a lot of saris become uh, heirloom pieces that are passed down. And, and this, of course, has to do with maybe just the actual textile and the value of it and, and the intricacy of it, of the weave or of the embroidery. But at the same time, a lot of people hold on to saris that are, that are soft, that are aged, that are torn, that are darned, right? And I think that speaks to a lot of the memory that the sari also holds with it. As well. Right. What else were we saying sari was? Well, I would love to talk about that, uh, how textile is also very important to sari. Mm -hmm. As is as important as, uh, imagine that you, every community have a different kind of trouser. Just imagine that for a moment. Uh, you won't believe that the, 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 the different kind of food we have from reason to reason, or the languages, so we have different kind of saris as well. It is, uh, it's, it's even hard to document sometimes the, the kind of weave, variation, and in terms of not only the uh, weaving them, but also the kind of uh, the pattern-wise and many different, different ways. Mm -hmm. So I just must tell you that Sari A is also, it didn't happen like overnight to India. It's, it's kind of three kind of Sari. One is a woven Sari. Second is the surface ornamentation, meaning the fabric is woven on handloom or power loom, and then you put embroidery over it. And third would be, uh, it's a printed sari, like block printed sari, which had pattern and this and that. It's very interesting that, that weaving only happened with the cotton grew or the silk procured, so they become a weaver-centered uh, reason. And in, like in Rajasthan area where there's, uh, the cotton do not grow, and then they started putting uh, block printing, and also when the, in a desert area when men goes uh, hunting, and then women started doing embroidery over it. So everything a very scientific, anthropological view of, of it. So it has a lot of depth, and I think one of the other things that a sari is, is it's a utilitarian, it's a very functional garment. And so one of the things that we've seen, um, of course, you know, looking at all the drapes and, and the about a hundred that have been documented, which of course means there was many more than that, um, but is that saris were draped in different ways for a particular reason, right? So if you were um, a Goan, you know, fisherwoman, you would wear your sari shorter so that when you were wading in the water, um, you know, it wouldn't get wet. And, you know, th there was this, this WhatsApp that went viral and was forwarded to us a number of times, and a lot of people, maybe even the audience, might have got it, and it was about, it was called My Mom's Sari Falu. And it was just this, this poem that someone had written anonymously about 
what the sari palu meant uh, to her. And she spoke about, when I was younger, it was used to dry my tears. It was also used to hold me as a child. And when guests came over unannounced, it very quickly dusted a bunch of furniture, right? And so it just went on and on. And it was really nice to see it travel across because I think so many people resonated, whether they wore a sari or not, whether man, woman, child, young, old. And I think when we speak about the sari and say, what is it? It is, at the end of the day, an incredibly powerful garment. And I think uh, that's a word that has kept coming to me in terms of um, the work that we've been doing because people feel a very strong sense of ownership over it. They feel um, a connectedness to it. It doesn't necessarily have to do with identity, with being Indian, with being a woman. Um, it's just, it has this power and the strength that's, that's very hard to quantify. So when we were looking, or, or to, to qualify, so when we were I'm trying to answer what is a sari. These are some of the things that came to mind and we, we thought to share, to share with all of you. And so just as a next step before we get into one of the films, um, just wanted to brief you on, on the project, the sari series. Essentially, like we said, it was about 90 short films, uh, each one dedicated to a particular regional drape. Each film is about two minutes long, and uh, these will be available online. They launch on October 10th. And another part of the project that was really important us to create at the same time was a short series of three films by three different filmmakers that were completely independent from the how-tos. So what you'll see later is the how-tos, which are very, um, it's kind of like those how-to videos on Facebook where someone's cooking, it's like a white screen, it's very clearly led to understand how to do something, but these three films were very important to us because, like we just said, Asari is so many things, and we thought, okay, sure, we have the how-tos, but how can we get some of the stories and express or share what the Sari means to people? So, Pooja Kal is a filmmaker based out of Stockholm, and um, her work is something that we've been familiar with for a few years. Uh, due to her sensitivity um, in storytelling, and uh, she's an incredibly uh, special woman, very, um, very inquisitive and uh, very e emotionally sensitive. And so we reached out to her, and this is something that she you know, was kind enough to join us for in terms of develop developing a 10-minute um, film, independent film, called Sundar Sari, which means beautiful sari, which you'll see next. And um, we have one with Bon Duke, who is a Brooklyn-based filmmaker who worked with us on filming all the 84 how-tos, um, as well as a short clip. You'll also see his today. That's a one-minute clip. And, uh, and then we also have Q, who is one of India's, uh, considered one of India's most provocative filmmakers. Uh, some of his films have even been um, you know, sort of banned given their sort of the, the nature of their storytelling. And he had been looking at working on a documentary for the Sari for mm -hmm. over the last 10 years, and he had gotten along the way unclear of what the Sari meant. He was trying to find the story of the Sari, but he just found that he found so many, st you know, so many stories that he had all this footage. So when we found out about that, he said, I'll happily make you a short from um, you know, the footage that I have and the funds that we gave him from this project allowed him to revisit that full-length feature film. Uh, so his is about the involvement of men. Will, will you, are you going to say the men also wear a Sari in a kind of a lungi form? You know what, that's also, I mean, what makes a sari a sari, right? I mean, I think that's a very good, a very good question. I think we have, we have three, we have three how-to videos that are just bottom drapes that are traditionally worn by men. And I think one of the things we've realized is that as India, um, as the design language of India, as we begin to speak more about design in India, we find that we've appropriated the English language or a particular language to express things that are uniquely Indian. So was a sari ever called a sari, right? So when someone wore a baluchari, they never said they wore a baluchari sari. It was always just a type, baluchari. it was just a type of sari or a kanjivaram. No one said she's wearing a kanjivaram sari, it was just a kanjivaram. So we've actually affixed, like, affixed sari as a term and therefore truncated certain things, made men's into women, certain lengths, right? It's kind of, uh, I think what Malika is saying is, I give an, another example, it's kind of Hinduism, which very much, I think, legally called Hinduism, which, which happened very late to India. It, the people practice the religion in different parts of India very differently. They mm -hmm. didn't know whether it's called the uh, same religion. 
So it's kind of a sari, you wear it in a different way. You never Fair call enough. it a sari. You put it and club them and you say, okay, this is a sari. So you're bound to, So maybe, to, yeah. by, by mm -hmm. the same example, maybe sarong is also part of a sari. So it, it's, you can just go back and trace really back how long, how, you know, you can go from sarong to a yeah. sari. And then India also has around 108 way of draping sari. So it can just keep going, actually. And I think we're so used to trying to find the black and white or right or wrong, and sometimes there is that, I mean, more often than not, there's that ambiguity that we find it's hard to be comfortable in, but it's important too. So in any case, um, and so we thought we'd kind of segue now into textile and saris. And um, maybe um, as a textile designer, Sanjay, you can tell us how important is textile to a sari? Well, as, as I did say that, as important as my food, Mm -hmm. my <laughs> my individuality i think what really sari give to uh, to a woman to in terms of the sense of who you are and that it's kind of a uh, what you wear is a communicating where you come from what you are in many different ways like no communication is a communication so i'm going to give you a small example if you go to a pija shop you say these are the bread and these are the toppings and that's let's say a kind of uh, sauces you put on it or, or the ketchups and things like that. So imagine a sari into three types. So A say that the, the material content. So sari comes in cotton, sari comes in silk, silk cotton variation. Then comes sari with the, then the variation of the, the, the thread, uh, the count of the silk starts. Meaning some, or, some of them are uh, like a one, uh, in the one dent, there's a called reed, which, uh, which uh, uh, kind of uh, decide the width of the sari, control the width of the sari. So every dent has a one thread of silk. So there is a one thread to three thread of the silk also it has. And at the same time, uh, it has some woolen saris and then airy silk and then mulberry silk mm -hmm. and uh, the tusser silk. So that is a content of the sari. Then you have a patterns and the and pattern of the sari. So you can have paisleys, you can have temple border, you have peacock, you have um, uh, camels, and you have then print and embroidery. And third would be category would be different different kind of drapes. So as I said, there are different width of it, different length of it, and different uh, drape. So imagine there are three different kinds. Every different kind of sari come from what reason is kind of a mixer of all three things. A, the drap, drape really matters, that content of the sari and the pattern, and what makes sari what it is today. So when you see someone like a turban, when you see a, uh, see a turban of someone in someone's head, so you literally see the way A, that what it's made of and how is it tied also on someone. You know their caste, their status, society, where it's come from, like the sari. So you literally know there's a Gujarati woman coming in, or there is a South Indian woman, or there is a come from Northeast because they wear a sari in a two different part, Mekhula Chada. So it's, it's so varied, it's so hard to even document uh, uh, in terms of textile. And also you know that till, till 1940, it's, we, that's the only way to weave the sari. And so India being, uh, after the farming, India has the largest community who weave the sari. We have the biggest community who weave the sari as in weavers in terms of numbers. And others, uh, more than that, we also have in India has a textile ministry. So, uh, Srimati Smriti Rani. Uh, Smriti Rani is uh, current uh, minister for that. So it's it's wonderful the way we are dedicated a uh, sort of a life to textile, and then textile dedicated to us, vice versa. But to counter that, uh, you know, isn't the truth that the majority of saris worn in India today are 100% polyester, mill made, sold for under $10? Well, it is very interesting. So I always wanted to say that what does make, uh, there is a ajrak is a one kind of a print. I'm sorry, I don't want to bore you with that what it is. So, but the thing is that it comes in a very specific color. And also, it's also a natural dye and is printed on a specific fabric. And the pattern are geometric because worn by Pakistan and India border and is uh, mainly worn by Muslims because it doesn't have any animals or any kind of pattern. So what I really want to question is like, what does make ajrak what it is? It is a process of it, the color of it, or design of it. So in a way, sari is also very interesting. Like what does make sari what it is? The, the way, just the unstitched cloth is a sari to you? The way it is made is a sari to you? Or what is a pattern and the drape is a sari to you? So it's a very open-ended discussion, and like I think what it is. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and for, for, for me, I think um, the definition of a sari, so when you speak to purists, so for instance, Ritha Kapoor Chishti, who worked very closely with us, of course, on uh, the sari series, she's considered you know, one of India's foremost scholars and authorities on the sari. She's written the seminal book, Saris, Tradition and Beyond, and has spent um, many decades researching the drapes and the saris across India, and she considers herself um, a, a a purist, I'd say a staunch purist, uh, which is amazing to have because that has uh, its own level of as a barometer that we can react to. And so when we were asking this question of what makes a sari a sari, when we were trying to say, okay, we have 100 films, we need to find 100 saris. Which saris are we going to use? Are we going to use all handloom? So Rithanti was of the mind that we should use all handloom. And so this is something that we contemplated, but, you know, we said, do we use... Do we use the handloom sari from the region of the drape for every film so that it perfectly matches, that keeps the integrity of the drape, the textile, as a documentation, as a cultural documentation intact? And for us, it was very important with the project to do two things. One was to create a cultural documentation on film as an accessible resource. And the second was to speak to what we think is a needed perception shift of the sari. And for, for me, Sanjay, I think handloom is a very elitist garment, right? Like I said, the truth is that most people wear polyester. So again, one density. We spoke earlier about a sari handwoven having multiple densities, you know, within it to allow for it to drape properly. But, you know, polyester polyester is easy to wear, it's accessible, you know, it's just, I mean, it's the reason why people wear polyester or machine washable clothing today. Not everyone hand washes everything that they have. And so I think there's a reality there. And, and we decided to actually take that one step further and say, you know, maybe a sari can be Let's, can we, with this per perception shift, try to even push ourselves further and include something that isn't conventionally ever worn as a sari? So, you know, we did use uh, viscose jersey in one of our films. It's, it's a completely stretchy, um, drapey, you know, when it's draped, it almost looks like a Grecian sort of gown. It completely doesn't look like a sari. Um, that's, uh, that's a risk that we took. That's something that... That, that Sanjay is smiling because he has something to say, well, but, but, but go ahead. Well, I really think, I absolutely believe in changes and I think the tradition is a very ongoing, continuous thing. But at the same time, you know, to, to, to change the music, to make the music, I think it's interesting to know, or it's, uh, one need to know the, the sargam of it. Saregamapa, if you know it, then you can really play with it. So I really think it's great to have a jersey sari, but I don't know if you have your knees when you sit in a sari and you get up, then I'm sure you have knees in a sari. <laughs> or maybe <laughs> hips over there. Not everyone want to show or want to hips or a wealthy woman, uh, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> which we generally see in India. So that's exactly, so design, of course, is going to play a very important role. But as I said, I mean, mm. I'm, I'm, I'm okay for change. No one is saying the puristic way mm. is the right way. But so for women with no knees and no hips, the jersey sari is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but um, well, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I hear you. I, I think, I think it's, 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 it's not a right or wrong. Again, it, it's, it's a point of view. And, and I think, you know, one of my favorite films and favorite editorial images that we took is in the jersey sari. Because when you think about a sari and you see that, it's, it's, it, it it doesn't come to mind, and it 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 it, um, it takes away the limiting factor that the sari currently has as um, a very clearly defined silhouette from a particular place for a particular person. And um, Malika, you know why why did I say the most puristic point of view? Somewhere I agreed, and somewhere I said sure, yes. Yeah. There is always welcome for change. You see, that it didn't happen overnight. It's not the garment. Okay, last ten years or twenty years, it just happened, and suddenly people started wearing it. Mm -hmm. It have, must have gone through with so many changes. The width of it, length of it, tying of it is all like tested market, tested the water, mm -hmm. right? Sure. It didn't happen overnight. So it's interesting to see. If there are changes, changes are welcome. That what kind of changes there are, sure. And I hope they don't become a trend basis changes. I hope they come here to stay, not to change again. But I mean, I think for me that the last change in the sari, significant change, was in the early 1800s, which um, during the Victorian era was the introduction of the blouse and the petticoat. And I think that's quite astounding that since the Victorian era we haven't had a significant change in the garment. So I'm uh, not just as a, as, a, as a sort of a 
kind of history, the sari was traditionally never worn with a petticoat um, or a blouse. And, and none of the films that we've done have um, a petticoat in them. Uh, I don't wear a sari with a petticoat. Uh, that was introduced during the Victorian era to mimic uh, the sort of the, the petticoat itself with the frills at the bottom. And then the blouse was worn for, for modesty as being bare-chested, wasn't seen as something um, fit for for society. Um, and since then, the sari has been seen as a an uncut piece of cloth, right, the sari, the blouse, and the petticoat. And even now, when we speak about the definition of what is a sari, if someone has a sari with a blouse and a petticoat there, or they're gifting it to someone, they will never say, I am gifting a sari, a blouse, and a petticoat. They will just say, I'm gifting a sari. It's almost synonymous with that. And I think for most people, the idea of wearing a sari without a blouse or a petticoat is seen as very radical. I think the one thing we've seen, and, and Raw Mango actually deserves a lot of credit for this, in the silhouette is move away from the choli, which was the sort of tight-fitting, midriff bearing top, uh, to, to, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about the blouse and why for you that was something. So his is away from the body, um, it's higher on the neck, and it's become something that's in the fashion industry that's widely uh, copied and influenced blouse silhouettes and the saris well, across the country. I think I would love to discuss and share that on the, the, what's the perception of the sari. Oh yes, the I was one. skipping, I was but, jumping but, ahead. Uh, yeah, but it's right. quite... Yeah. Yeah. Should we, we'll, we'll continue with yeah, textiles. So this is one of the cotton saris as in different kind of materials. So here, and we... Here is woven in a, this is a woven in Bengal. Yeah. And I think, yeah, the cotton sari is, is a good starting point in terms of a basic for daily wear, daily wear for khadi, yes. right? And, and this one is specifically is woven in uh, Beng uh, Banaras as brocade, red brocade in a mulberry silk sari. And why is brocade important? Why is brocade, brocade important? important? And Banarasi, I mean, in terms of the I trousseau? Think it, it terms, uh, as you know, the India wasn't the, one of the country who, only, who always wove in silk, and you know mm -hmm. that it came after China. Mm -hmm. But what, what very interesting to see is that we also, it's kind of an amalgamation of techniques and material and a Mughal influence on India. We did have a very, I don't know how many, I don't want to again uh, say that. There's something called Jala technique. It's, it's kind of a, what do you call it in English? Uh, the the, the the farmer uses also, like an akda. Um, uh, what is that called? A hoe? Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. Something yeah, a like sickle? that. So there was a technique know, yes, like that yeah. which was only done in India. But after Mughal, Mughal intervention, they knew how to make patterns. It's called naksha, mapping like a jacquard without jacquard. So that's kind of a kind of a very interesting. Really, mm -hmm. see a Ganga Jamna Tehjeeb mm -hmm. of of Indian culture. Well, and Banarasi saris especially, I think, in the, I mean, about, up until 20 years ago, were considered a necessary trousseau item for most Indian brides. So I know my mom has them, my mother-in-law has them, everyone has beautiful old Banarasis. Um, and, um, yeah, now we're at perception. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, but it's interesting to see that how come India, or textile played a very big, important role in our, um, uh, in a politics and a country freedom fight, uh, it's quite quite simple at the same time. As you, as I told you that after the farming, uh, we were the one of the largest community who weave, and it's kind of a mean of a, a self-sustained system. And Gandhi really uh, thought of importance of self-sustaining, and that's why Khadi played an important role. So I want to cut it very short. At the same time, then just to keep in sync with the normal masses, all the politicians actually wore handloom. So it's quite interesting. So always handloom is worn by a politician. And, and, and Indra and, Gandhi and is by, by all the yeah. prime minister, sure. by all the pr lady prime minister, all the ministers are also, uh, even the, the man leader, they also wear like a khadi, kurta, and pajama. What is interesting to see is that while it happened, but in the last three decades, it didn't move anywhere. And people thought it's a bit outdated and without change. And that's how Bollywood come in picture. And they start using a sari like this, so the sheer chiffon sari we can just show off. So, and also youngster audience started thinking that, you know, the handloom sari is a bit bhanjis, like a, like an old sister sari. So, and also it's a very stereotype, very, very NGO woman, very, very stereotype that you do not wear handloom because you think you look old in them. So that's how I think the perception shifting would need to change that what is that young sari and what is that old sari? What is the fashion sari, which is what is the revival sari and what is 
heirloom pieces. So not every single sari is heirloom piece also, mm -hmm. right? So as she discussed correctly, like not everyone think a polyester sari is a heirloom piece. So very interesting in the perception has been seen by terms of age, community, status, and many different views. And I think with regards to perception, I mean, this is on the left, Sri Devi and Mr. India in, in the early 80s. 80s. This is, of course, Priyanka Chopra, um, you know, just a few years ago. And again, this perception of this sensual woman in the rain and the chiffon sari, you know, decades later is still the sort of uh, kind of narrative that's being played. Uh, and what I'd like to point out here and in Indira, Gandhi, Indira Gandhi's case or in any other media politi politics or Bollywood or on the streets is that, that the drape is still the same. There continues to be this um, very narrow perception at the end of the day for what a sari is. And I'd venture to say before you know you all came here, if you know we asked everyone to draw what they thought a sari was, I would say you know nine out of ten or even maybe more than that would draw something similar, which is you know pleated in the front over the left shoulder because that is the visual imagery that's been propagated through um, any of the social channels that we all have access to um, and you know that's also seen on I also want to say here even the in the te television advertisement also very interestingly seen whenever they're trying to sell a sample or something they will show some suddenly someone in mini skirt or a, a, like a modern clothing when they have to shop something something related to let's say water security family suddenly show the woman or washing yeah. machine suddenly show a woman in a sari so it, 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 it is there, back of their head, that what is a perception? They already have it. You don't put it on the piece of paper. Yeah, absolutely. No, for sure. And I think, I think that's the interesting thing happening in, in maybe the smaller design community in circles, especially in India, is that you know, cotton saris or things like that are, are being worn and very comfortably worn by many, many people and without that association, right? So but that's well, still I, very small. I must say on that. So, just because of academic and, and, and it's, it's been thought as a perceived like that only intelligent people wear or maybe a handloom sari and that kind of in a perceived like That's NGO true. academic as I said earlier. It's very interesting to see the how fashion week also in India has just changed. They also had a textile week just now which is a whole day is dedicated to textile, textile day. day and also sari is opening fashion week. There's a two fashion week happens between Delhi and Mumbai. One of them opens. Uh, it, you could not ever imagine this in India that it'll ever happen, but it just happened. Like la last few, I would say in last five years it all happened. Sure. So sorry, uh, like people like me also given a chance and I opened and I closed one of the show, which was very interesting to see that how do they see a textile designer. Earlier, we, I don't think I had any role to play in terms of fashion, what fashion has been understood there. Yeah, no, and, and so, so Ram Ang and Sanjay Greg never participated in fashion weeks, but this, this fashion's sort of appropriation of textile and, and craft um, to, ideally it should be there because they're both sides of a coin, especially in India. Fashion is built on the backbone of craft, but the fashion industry appropriates it when it's largely trend-based and, you know, as, as the fashion industry does. Um, and, and I think it, it, it it's strategic that they've placed Textile Day as the first day, and it speaks to exactly what Sanjay is saying, where it's about a perceived importance or intelligence, um, which is which is very interesting. It's interesting how a textile uh, can 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 no. equate to in, in people's mind to intelligence. I just um, that hasn't left in, in a long time. Um, this is an interesting um, series of imagery, which I'm very familiar with. Sanjay had never seen it. I don't know if, uh, I, I, how I many people are familiar with these types of images. <laughs> Can we get a show of hands? Yeah, a lot. See, people know. I Googled it. I said, I don't think you've ever seen these before, Sanjay. But um, I thought this was also interesting. I mean, it's a very North American um, sort of, you know, the bridesmaid uh, phenomenon in India, you have have them, but it's not a formal sort of, um, you know, sort of formal recognition where everyone's given an outfit necessarily. Um, there's millions uh, of photos like this online. Uh, they're beautiful and they're incredible, but again, uh, they're, they're, that, that drape for me is something I just keep seeing. They're all these, you know, as you scroll down, um, and there just seems to be a, a correct way. And I think one of the perceptions of the sari is that there's, one way to wear it, there's one way to drape it, and there's a correctness within that. And so a lot of people say, 
you know, the pleats need to be perfect. You need to have pins. It needs to be of your shoulder. It needs to be flat, horizontal on, you know, on the hem needs to be uniform all around. And I'm always struck by, you know, this is a fluid draped garment and imposing this rigidity on it, um, which people don't have when they wear it on a daily basis. I mean, when someone, you know, is at home and, and cleaning, if the maid's there, she picks up her pleats, she tucks them into her waist. When she leaves, she untucks it. Um, I mean, it's a very fluid garment that, that adapts, but somehow outside of India, and I'm, you know, born and raised in Canada, I've been living in India for 10 years, but, um, and I've seen definitely both sides of it, is, is growing up, there was this very formal way, because saris were only worn on occasion where um, outside of India, there was this rigidity imposed and, and this correctness that actually made it feel much less accessible. So the perception of it was that it had to be this perfect, pristine thing, and then you had to have the churis that matched, and the bindi, and I mean, it just went on and on and on, and it's a little bit foreign for, for, for Sanjay, but it's very much part of the, the narrative that I know I personally experienced as well. So anyways, um, so we're moving along, and um, these are a few images of, of, of the Sari series. Um, and uh, these were released in, in June on uh, the Google Arts and Culture platform, which we were very fortunate to be invited to join and uh, preview, uh, sorry, release a preview of the images. And just wanted to share with you, um, just to see the diversity of the different types of drapes, where we've seen this image over and over. But the perception that a Sari can be um, something like this where I think the one on the left is a black chiffon worn with a lace, you know, a lace uh, bodysuit. The one next to it is a kanji varam. It's a very, you can see right away, it feels very South Indian, even the color story. Um, it's absolutely beautiful. The one in the middle is a cotton sari with, it's a Goan drape. Um, this is one, of course, a lot of people are familiar um, with the Kerala sari with the beautiful gold border. Uh, it's worn without a blouse, that's all one piece. This here on the right is um, lame, and it's uh, hand-dyed uh, and worn with a t-shirt. And then we have an old, uh, old chiffon sari um, that is worn almost, I'll use the word toga, where it's up above the shoulder. So this was to speak to the idea of, of, of shifting those perceptions a little bit. But just to take it one step further, um, you know, this again is one of the images. This is a, a, a drape um, from Andhra Pradesh. It's a nine-yard sari. Um, the image on the right is, is another piece of collateral that we created with this project. Um, this is shot by a photographer, R. Berman, who, uh, who we created about 10 editorial images with. And we felt, just like the film you saw earlier, that this was a necessary layer to be able to even take the perception that we were creating by creating this accessibility um, to, let's say, a fashion um, sort of push it a little bit further, right? Where it's the same drape, um, it's a different fabric, and it's a different energy. Um, and, you know, I think that this speaks for itself in terms of limitless possibilities, um, including this one over here, which is um, a drape from Chhattisgarh. This is a beautiful drape that isn't, uh, it, it doesn't have a knot, it doesn't have a pleat, it's just kind of wrapped around the body. And here we have the same one worn on top of uh, a kurta and sort of knotted instead. So both the exact same drape worn in two different ways. And um, I think it adds you know, to, to the conversation of it being relevant to different audiences as well. Yeah? Um, oh yeah, present day. Okay, we're rounding up. So, so I mean, I feel, Sanjay, we've, we've spoken about so much in terms of the saris so far, but your business is built on the backbone of saris, and as a, as a revenue, as a business, you need it. It needs to grow, ideally, right? But so what do, you, what do you see? What are some of your things you're seeing, some of the concerns you maybe well, have? Uh, it definitely, as I said, that uh, the worry to me is a perception, first of all. If youngsters don't think that sari is no more their thing and don't, they don't wear it and if 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 you uh, like a sari is kind of a baggage to me whenever you wear a sari in india itself in urban cities right now they will ask you oh what's happening today is there your anniversary or is there a festival at home or you have a puja mm -hmm. so it's kind of a baggage when you wear a t-shirt and jeans you don't ask like why are you doing this you wear it to to hide yourself right so there is a tag to it i really want to a that the the, the people stop asking why you're wearing a sari a that would be day. 
So we need to develop more and more uh, day wear sari, though I have to, to run my business, I have to make wedding saris too. <laughs> and at the same time, you know, there are many questions. I'm going to just discuss mm -hmm. few. I also think that is sari worn by only Indian? Is like sari can we ever become yoga? So not everyone Indian has to do yoga or not yoga has to be changed in terms of form to become their part of their lifestyle. Can't be just simple piece of cloth can be become their part of life. Everyone's part of life. And however they drape it is their own. Because it, it gives their own identity. It's sari is nothing that we own it to me, honestly. I mean, and why that's actually can't a sentiment we, that a lot yeah. of people feel. I mean, uh, why? Yeah. What is my contribution in terms of the world fashion? It's like a Vasudev Kutumbakam. If world is a one family, where do I stand? Why is it make so you and us? Well, and I think that's actually a very beautiful sentiment. And one of the things that, um, and I've addressed this, you know, b before, but I'll say it to this audience because we're actually in North America, is that you know during the, the development of this project. Um, people here would ask, you know, what about can I wear a sari? Um, what about, you know, cultural appropriation? What if you're not Indian? You know, a lot of these sensitive questions kind of came about, which makes sense. But at the same at the same time, we had conducted a, a survey before we started the project with. 100 men and women under the age of um, under the age of 30 in urban uh, cities across India, and we asked them this question. We said, "What would you would you be okay with a you know non-Indian perceived non-Indian person wearing a sari?" And you know, overwhelmingly, by like 99 point something percent people, well, 99 percent, they didn't see any issue with it. I think this sense of openness with regards to the garment is such a beautiful thing that in Indians, I feel overwhelmingly, if, if, if something's done with respect or worn with respect, um, I don't think I've met anyone who would ever have an issue with someone wearing a, a sari. So I think that's definitely something that... And at the same time, as a designer, I also really want to say, I think the sari would going to be saved by design of it. Mm -hmm. See, we cannot be... Uh, it's kind of a river with flowing room. It's kind of a language. Like, a, we, don't ever, we don't speak Sanskrit now. We only know Hindi. And why English is such a popular language, you keep on adding words every single year, right? So how does sari is going to be, A, that it influenced already to reach here, with so many, come with so many influences, and I think there's a long journey. If we stick to it, this is what sari is, and that's how it, it is going to be, I don't think so is going to be, there's a future then. I think is need to follow as reward is not not it need to go through many different influences, mm -hmm. um, weather type, lifestyle, and I think that's how it's going to live with sari. Well, um, I think I think there's also you know every few years this conversation about the sari. I know a lot of us are are sick sick of it. A lot of people say, oh God, save the sari or this that, and and that's not the, the narrative that you know either of us are involved in. But there is a question of its relevance um, that that continues, especially um, in, in urban India. And I think it's important to contextualize a lot of what we're discussing being in urban urban Indian uh, conversation or, or concern or consideration, especially with regards to it moving towards more occasion wear. But I think, you know, we're here, we're here speaking with you. There's obviously, it's resonating with, you know, an institution, with a group of people. We're also here to attend the opening of the new exhibit at the MoMA, in which some of these films have been included. I think there's a strong connect there. I think it's been, um, you know, I think there is, that the answer to its relevance is, is yes, it is relevant, but for whom, to what, uh, to what end? Again, I, I don't think we have the answer to any of that, but um, it definitely, for me, kind of ties into the larger conversation about India, particularly with regards to our developing, um, our developing industries, our developing aesthetics that we've always had, but the sense of confidence, the sense of um, ownership, of, of pride, you know, with regards to homegrown um, culture, uh, offerings is something that I still see will grow from strength to strength and so I think the sari conversation fits into very much the conversation of of where India is at and it, in it, its existence and its comfort zone that's how I see it at least the film has about uh, 10 saris from from very important women um, you know including um, 
uh, India's first female pilot, Sarla Thakral, um, as well as Chandraleka, who was um, a very uh, revered and wonderful dancer who's passed away. Uh, also Ruth St. Dennis, who's um, a contemporary dance pioneer whose work we've admired for, for many years. There's a lot of women saris in that uh, film, so this is just also, all of this is just hot off the, hot off the press, so all the kind of uh, narrative and synopsises are coming and will be ready in a few weeks, but it's just a bit of a sneak peek. Um, and so the idea for that is to just, again, I think, I mean, I think it's clear, it's just, it feels much more, I think, of a present day uh, narrative while using very wonderful saris that are, you know, historical and, and old as well. Um, and now we will show you just two how to drapes um, from, from the series. This is the nine yard that you'd seen earlier. And again, a very different language here, but um, we have about 84 of these. Well, we do have 84 of them uh, with voiceovers as well. Mine was done for ease, but just... Uh, And of course, just wanted to acknowledge, of course, our, our patrons, Good Earth, um, who is the lead patron of, of this project, who really stepped forward um, from a very early stage to help support us, and later supported by Verve as well, which is India's oldest um, women's lifestyle magazine, and uh, they're associate producers of this film I'm about to show right now. And this is um, just the second and the last one that we're showing today, but it's from Kerala.
And that's it. Um, shall we open it up for Q&A from the audience, perhaps? Yes. Sure. That, that's a very good question. Should we? Oh. Um, so the origins of the sari are something, like I was saying earlier about that gray zone, which are, uh, it, it, there's no exact um, timeline known, but uh, it can be traced back as early to the Harappan, oh, Harappan, yeah, um, civilization, which is, correct me if we... I think 2500 BC, I'm sure people... Harappan civilization, anyone? Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> I know that the that's dates. the... BC, BC. okay. BC, um, and... Um, and 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 we don't. It seems to potentially have traveled through even you know from from Greece, right? And traveled so um, from a, a, a shorter length, from a two piece to become a one piece to covering you know before not covering the chest and after. But tracing the history of it actually is something that you find a few different versions online, and um, there isn't any known sort of documentation that kind of authenticates its. I, I don't think really. it wasn't, uh, uh, yeah. Can I answer it a little bit? It's kind of, uh, if I say so, as I said in beginning that what you call sari today, A, this question, so it's kind of Hinduism also has been practiced, and there's no, not really found a date, like who invented, who is that God? It's kind of a philosophy is that it's been practiced by many, and then you called it because it, it's kind of a more of a reasonable entity than, than who invented it. There's not one God, there's no one invented. Then you call it, uh, near to the Sindhu river because, and one of the tribe could not pronounce them Sindhu, so they started calling them Hindu, and that's why the name also given to it. So you don't really know, like, what, who invented it. Like, there's no, not one person. One person, yeah. It's, it, it, it's an evolutionary garment. I think we have a few questions here. Um, so the first one here is, how can, a fa how can fashion be inspired by a sari and be culturally sensitive? It's a very good question. Um, I think we see it all the time. I think the saris influence is something in fashion that's really exciting to see, whether it was, um, you know, even just, I mean, Jean-Paul Gaultier continues for decades to be inspired by the sari, but his last latest couture show had many iterations of it. Um, I, think, I think to be culturally sensitive, um, I think being, and I said this earlier, but being re respectful is probably the core tenant. And if one has, um, you know, uh, respect and uh, works works within the framework of that, um, there's still such a wide open net of, of exploration and, and iterations. And I think fashion, um, the sari has influenced fashion, um, whether it's been Chanel, Jean-Paul Gaultier, other designers for, for Amis. decades. Hermes. I mean, there's so many people that continue to draw from the drape, not just necessarily as a textile, as a length, but what, what happens to drape. And I think that's one of the things that's really exciting for us in the how-tos is that um, it creates accessibility to draping and draping for anybody who's a design student or who designs knows that that's something that people often, you know, just look to in terms of form, in terms of garment construction. It's, it's a core part of garment construction. And so just creating access to that, whether or not it looks like like a sari isn't the point or the end game, but um, the drape is very transformative and, and very powerful. What do you have? Are there any colors that you would not wear, personally, there, there, or? There, there, yeah. there, nothing like that. <laughs> yeah. But of course, the colors are very specific to the ritual, culture, uh, the puja, the, the, the temple hall processions, and even uh, wedding and a married woman to unmarried, uh, to sorry, widow. Those, they've been uh, culturally been a specific color, like white saris worn by all those widows, and the married women wear uh, bright color saris. Only a Kerala, one of the exemption that it, they wear a white sari with the gold border, which you saw here. And at the same time, in like, I, I can talk about Marwadis in the community, they don't really wear a black saris or a deep indigo saris on the weddings. So there's nothing such thing. Now is very much open. People wear all the color all the time, but uh, there are certain ritual situations where they're very color specific. Mm -hmm. Mostly related to marriage and death, um, pretty much. Um, have you documented um, how working women are wearing the saris in new ways? Uh, no. We have not. Sorry, uh, have documented how working or a new generation 
how your generation of working women are wearing the saris in new ways. I'm, you know, I think I think that's a really interesting question. We have we haven't we have not, and um, I think one of the things that's really exciting to think about is not just about 84 drapes or over 100 ways, but asking the question, why can't we wear it any way we want? So for instance, I'm wearing a drape now I've worn for years that someone asked me where it's from, and then I realized I just made it up. It, it's obviously from a drape, but it's from my comfort zone. And I was just draping this today, and I was telling Sanjay, I was wearing it the same way yesterday. I said, oh, God, I've got to find a new drape. But this is sort of my go-to because it's, it's something that I've adapted over the years. It's shorter. It just makes the sari for me just something that I can wear, like, and jeans or whatever or whatever it is. I mean, I wear a sari more than I wear jeans. But, you know, I, I think that question of... of can, what can a sari be? How, why can't anyone drape it however way they want? I mean, if the drapes came from um, a function, they were utilitarian or evolution, then, you know, that speaks to the idea that, you know, that sort of informed... Like, Nawari is almost like a trouser, and, and it's, it's even a warrior lady wear, like Jhansi Kirani wore it, and the, the woman who work in a farm also wear that sari. It's almost like a trouser. Yeah, and I think that that, that basic question of, of our project or of point of view was not, um, you know, why aren't women wearing the sari? It was, it was what does a sari look like on a woman today? And I think that um, is a little bit open-ended and excited, and, and I would invite anyone to, to drape a sari. I mean, what I am, who's, who's to say is the question. Why can't we wear it any way, way we want? want yeah, yes, absolutely. Well, that, that to do with the, the whole lifestyle, I think the way, I'm sure they're going to stereotype again. They're going to, I'm sure they stereotype already a tight jeans to a, you know, hug t-shirt to a, to a skirt. So I don't think so we should be bothered about them as such, you know, because then again, then we need to document like, what do they think of it? I, I don't know think so because they'll be always something they're going to think, right? Everyone's going to think things yeah, all something. the time anyway. But I'm trying to say there will be always a communication. They're always going to make out of something. I don't think so. I'm worried about that. I was so much worried about that, that how do we, we think among ourselves that what is sari? Like, how do you think that what is your sari? So if you're working, if there's a summer day and you think the sari too many of layer, why don't you ha wear like a four meter of a sari? You don't have to wear it with a petticoat. Or you wear a knit t-shirt. Or do you wear a sari with the overcoat? That kind of solution, I think, come with the personality, individuality. Do you like stripe? Do you like no pattern? Do you like two piece of textile? Do you can you wear the shawl as a sari? I think that the the day you know what is sari, what is your communication? What like what is that sari which matches in terms of pattern, textile, and also the drape? I think that is the day which gives us a confidence to wear it one. Sure. Someone asked, like, where is the best place to go to a sari in New York? To get a sari in New York. Yeah, I just got a week yeah. here, so I don't know. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I think I, I have to say, do, do not know the answer to that. Do, do you have the answer? Or, so I'll just repeat the question for those who didn't hear. She, uh, she, the, the question is about the silvar kameez and the sari, and is there sort of a, a, a connection between the two in terms of perception? So she was saying earlier that someone said that the silvar kameez is maybe more liberating than a sari, where a sari is seen as more traditional. Um, so is that is that kind of the case? Do you want? Well, it, it happened through different, A, that you know India has also come from a small, small country, come in a way become a one country. So as, uh, I, it, I can just do one, one small example. I, I absolutely hear you that in South India also now, like a married, unmarried woman wear a salwar kurta, it's kind of a dress code, and after marriage they start wearing sari. It, is, it just happened in recent decades, two decades. But I think the silver kameez also originated, right? And it has a very clear point of origin that, in the Punjab right, but, region. But she's right, right that there's a yeah. perception shift that they think is more liberating, more young. Yeah, so whereas we were saying earlier, the sari, that history, because it's so old and it doesn't have a sense of ownership, i.e. from North India, South India, um, it has a stronghold throughout the country. Um, with, with the silver kameez, there's a clear point of origin from the Punjab region, you know, that was pre pre part and then it has traveled from there. So it is newer in that way. Um, definitely we've heard... But as interestingly, the way you wear it today and also in the fashion week what happens, all the girls who never wore a sari also wear a sari. And they think it's, it's much cooler. 
they they do with the t-shirt with the boot Still and a they, very you know small what i'm saying the perception yeah, yeah. but it's a small community sure. but all we can say we can work all towards it there's a cert certain change of course the way now actually uh, i must say that the all the celebrities also wearing a lot of handloom which they didn't wear in last 30 years not on the red carpet at least that goes back there's to so the intelli much, perceived intelligence yeah that's how yeah. the the perceived intelligence and how do you perceive it now they think is a much cooler garment Sure. So the question is, have, have I personally had any overwhelmingly positive or nev negative experiences wearing the sari and any advice for someone who, I guess, outside of India or in this environment is looking to wear it? It's a great question. Um, so I'm familiar with the sari, but like I said earlier, much more as occasion wear. Um, I remember very much when I shifted towards wearing saris, it was very conscious for me. It was a conversation I had with a friend who owns um, whose family owns the oldest sari shop uh, in 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 current like in in Bangalore, and um, we were looking at her saris, saying, you know, her mother wears it every day, and and it's like these are gorgeous saris. And she said, we said, yeah, let's try to wear it, you know, try to wear it more often. So we decided we'd try to wear it, make the transition into day wear, and you know, it just never got around to it. And one day I saw her a few weeks later, and she was wearing the sari in the daytime. I said, what are, what are you doing? She said, yeah, she's like, I just got into it a few days ago and wearing it. It's fine. It's like okay, so I. So I wore a sari the next day, and it was it was a thing for me in India too um, to to wear it because again I I'm so used to it as as this occasion wear garment, and that's where I developed wearing it shorter because I think for me even if I was to wear a long dress I would feel like that's a gown. I feel anything long for me just to me feels much more occasion wear, um, and um, and specifically here I remember the fr the first time I wore a sari. Um, was t was a black pashmina. I wore it to Paris Fashion Week. Um, I wore the same one here. I remember it was with my friend Nira, and we were walking in the East Village, and we were in a store, and I think we were maybe both wearing one. And someone said, "Are you, are you wearing Yoji?" And I was just, you know, it's just so interesting where you know people feel a need to place it. It was it was a black pashmina. It was it was um, with a, a an oatmeal cashmere sweater. For me, it's imp I. You know, I was going to wear this sari uh, today. I had it on, and Sanjay and I both looked, and we said, it's a bit much for New York. It just felt, you know, just the context is always important, right? But this, for me, doesn't feel a lot for New York. And as, maybe it has to do with it being darker or whatever it has to do. But um, for me, that's my comfort zone. So it's not about the sari, but it's about what the sari looks like. That definitely felt like a little bit much. Even though I wanted to wear it, it wouldn't be much in India at all. Um, I've never had a ne negative experience. In fact, people have just not um, even thought as wearing a sari. I think that it's just it's so unusual to maybe see it, um, I don't know, or, or see it draped or in the colors that I'm wearing or, or how it is. And I think that's true um, for a lot of my friends um, who are also in the audience here who I know wear saris, you know, echo the same sort of sentiment. So I say the advice is just go ahead and wear it. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, absolutely. Anyone else? Yeah, I think, yeah. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you all so much. Yeah. And thank you to FIT for having us, absolutely. And we're, we're here for a bit, so if there's any questions, we'd be happy to. But thank you all for coming out. Yes. Thank you so much, Tanya. Thank you. Was that all right? Yes.